Okay, so hello everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'll, I'll talk to you about hybrids. So that's, uh, I guess, the, the, the new twist. Hybrid sparse stochastic processes and the re resolution of linear inverse problems. I think the part without the hybrid I've already presented here. And so the part that is really new is, is uh, you know, the first word. <clears throat> and so maybe to set the context, so it's uh, exactly like uh, Cecile was telling you in the, in the previous talk, it's about uh, inverse problems. And so, so here the problem is to recover some unknown signal based on some noisy measurements here. And, and so we know the physics, so, so this uh, system matrix H. We have also like additive noise. And so usually what you do, you set up the problem uh, as a, an optimization task. And, and so you, you want to minimize the functional of, of that form. Here where you have a data term, so that uh, measures the consistency between the measurement and your reconstruction. And then a regularization. And you know, like uh, with P equal one or two, depending if you're a Wiener person or like more uh, <coughs> Uh, Osher, uh, etc., or compressed sensing. So that's sort of the <coughs> uh, variational setup. But uh, then what you can do also, like you can interpret uh, this regularization actually like uh, minus log of the uh, <coughs> prior probability distribution of, of the signal S. And then this would give you like a maximum a posteriori uh, reconstruction. Okay, so I, I want to tell you a little about uh, the, the, uh, the stochastic processes. And essentially what I want to do is to give you like a, a justification, especially for the one here, that would come from a, a stochastic point of view. And uh, so that goes with the sparse stochastic processes. And, uh, I, you know, I cannot give a talk without talking about splines. So that's my spline uh, <coughs> here slide. And... Uh, but it's a little different. So now what we have is a stochastic differential equation. So the derivative of some signal here should be equal to W. And now the W is what we call innovation. And actually this W here is a bunch of Dirac's. So the location of the Dirac's are, are random and their height also uh, follows a certain statistical distribution. So now, okay, so you know here the driving term and so you want to solve your equation. And so what you do, uh, you can like formally solve it by taking the integral. And uh, so if you take the integral of that, essentially what you will be doing, you will be replacing the Dirac's by the Green's function of the integrator, which is the heavy side function. So that's uh, what's written here. So it's the same sum here, a n <coughs> heavy side function. So it's uh, unit steps. And so what you get at the end is a piecewise constant signal like here and maybe also a boundary condition here, B1. Okay, so now actually this idea can be generalized and going again to this equation here, ds equal w. I mean, I mean, it's a little scary to write it like that, okay? So usually probabilist or, you know, will not really agree <laughs> with, with writing it like that, but uh, Okay, now if you allow yourself to be a generalized function, so the W is a tempered distribution, like for example, those Dirac's. And so then you can ask yourself, okay, now the W, I, I was using Dirac's to get splines because I like splines. Maybe you're a Gaussian person, so you, you like uh, Gaussian white noise so that you can also put there. Or actually you can put all kinds of other stuff that would be white noise, like for example, alpha stable white noise. So then you integrate and then actually what you get here, for example, in Gaussian case, you get Levy process, uh, uh, no, uh, Brownian motion, which is like uh, actually the first stochastic process, you know, described in the literature almost. Uh, if you have the Dirac's, you get compound Poisson. <coughs> and if you have like alpha stable, you get uh, Levy flight. And uh, uh, so that's a way of, 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 of seeing this generative method of, of creating a uh, sparse stochastic process. I must say that Levy was not describing it like that. Actually, Levy was working at uh, that side and, you know, like defining those entities that are continuous domain white noise is a little scary. It requires some math, but it, it can be done with, with the help of actually generalized stochastic processes. So there's a very nice framework that was uh, developed by the uh, Russian School of Mathematics. It, 
especially like Gelfond. And uh, so where actually the stochastic entities that you have are not necessarily functions, so they are like objects that are, you can see like random tempered distributions. And you don't look at them point-wise. Actually, what you do with distribution, you look by taking inner products with test function. But now if this guy is a random distribution, you do an inner product with a test function, actually you get a number. And this number is the ordinary uh, random variable. Okay, so, so actually the hard part is in fact to define what is the continuous domain white noise. But now if this W is defined, then you can solve your stochastic differential equation uh, symbolically like uh, just written like taking the inverse of, of L. <coughs> and here you have your st sparse stochastic process. Now the, 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 the thing here again, you can either look at it as a function or actually take inner products with, with test function. Now if you rewrite it like this, like with the L minus one W, now the trick of this theory is actually using duality. You can move this operator on this side and you obtain a new modified test function. <clears throat> and actually then you're back to the white noise. So that's very, very powerful because it means if you have solved your, your, your characterization of the white noise, you, you have the whole story, okay? Just uh, through the operator <coughs> uh, uh, L. And then actually what you do in practice, you try to decouple your process. So uh, you would want to apply L or let's say wavelets because wavelets are like operators, like this book by Yves Meyer, onlet et operateur, okay? So, so that exactly goes with that story. <coughs> so now, description of uh, uh, sparse stochastic processes. So what, what you have, so is the L, and in some sense the L defines the correlation structure, like second order statistics of your process. Now, just with the twist, okay, the S actually uh, is considered as, an, uh, as a random tempered distribution. And then what about the, the sparse in the sparse stochastic process? Actually, this, the sparse part is completely embodied in the W. Okay, W, which is the noise. And uh, actually, so the way we can describe it, we can take the W here, which is this white noise that only an engineer can draw because a mathematician would say that is no uh, makes no sense. But I'm an engineer, so I'm allowed to make some scribble here to <laughs> represent, <laughs> you know, this white noise anyway. So you, you do the inner product with the rect. Now, then you get a, a, a random variable. That's a normal random variable. And then now there's a very fundamental properties that the random variable that you get is actually infinite divisible. It was actually Paul Levy who really studied the infinite divisible laws when he, uh, you know, defined those Levy processes. And now, uh, for those who know infinite divisible processes, they are characterized by what's called, rightly, a Levy exponent, and which is, uh, you can obtain from the characteristic function. So uh, the thing, what you need to remember, uh, uh, let's say, infinite divisible variable is characterized by a function that is called the Levy exponent. Now, what is an infinitely divisible variable? It's actually a variable that you can split in n pieces, like x, so this random variable is identically distributed as the sum of, let's say, n uh, independent variables that are now identically distributed. And, and so this must be true, uh, and actually you must be able to do that for any n. Actually the way you can uh, uh, understand that this will create uh, uh, infinite divisible variable if you take now this rectangle and you actually you chop the rectangle in small pieces. Now all those guys are identically distributed because the noise is stationary and they are all independent because the support of those small rectangle is not overlapping and, and hence this shows that this guy just by construction is infinitely divisible. Okay, so now I, I think this is the first message that the probability laws of sparse stochastic processes are infinite divisible. And now how do you analyze them? <clears throat> so the trick is always to go back to the innovation. So that's the uncoupled guy. And, and remember now we, we know the characterization of like inner products of you know, your 
a, a white noise and, and a test function. And now, okay, now we are more interested on the side of, of the stochastic process. So that's the S. And so, for example, let's suppose we are doing a wavelet expansion of our stochastic process. Okay, so th psi here would be a wavelet. So now we rewrite uh, the S as L minus 1 W, and then we just, by duality, move the L minus 1 by taking the adjoint. And then this guy, we just rename it phi. You know, we, we consider it as a test function, but okay, there's a small catch here. We have to enlarge the domain, not just to test function, but to LP functions, and so that can be done. And now, if this guy phi here uh, uh, is, is in LP, uh, then actually this variable, the, the, you know, the, the wavelet inner product with S, but that you can write also as the phi with W, is infinite divisible because, you know, that's the way it is, actually. Any inner product of a white noise with a, any, any LP function gives you an infinite divisible uh, uh, random variable, then it will have a Levy exponent now that depends on phi and the f, which is the Levy exponent of the white noise. Anyway, so this gives you a formula. So in the Fourier domain, because the Levy exponent, you, uh, to get the characteristic function, you take e to the power exponential of the Levy exponent. So this is the characteristic function. By doing the inverse Fourier transform, actually you get the closed form form of, of uh, actually the, the, uh, the, uh, the distribution of the wavelet coefficient of your process. So anyway, this is just to say that uh, those uh, stochastic processes are kind of cool because you can really characterize the distribution in any basis, for example, <coughs> wavelets or, or what you want. And I mean, the details you can look at the book. It's even freely available on the web, at least in, in the pre-version. Now, okay, so, so what we do here, we're spanning the family of, of infinite divisible laws. So you may ask yourself, what is an infinite divisible law? I gave you the definition, maybe it doesn't tell you much, but let me tell you that the Gaussian is part of the family. Actually, the Gaussian is the only non-sparse guy that's part of the family. Now, all the other guys, and I'm giving you a few examples here, they all have fatter tails than the Gaussian. So it's even a, a theorem by Levy, it's called the levy kinchin theorem <coughs> that characterizes, uh, you know, the tail of, of infinite divisible laws and they're all heavy tailed. So the first guy here is Laplace. I, I, I think this is of interest to Cecile because it, it was given like the distribution that in principle we would match uh, with the total variation, you know, because you have here the L1 norm. <coughs> compound Poisson. So that was the example of those Dirac's hitting a test function. And so here what you have, you have lots of zero, so there's a Dirac at zero, and otherwise relatively heavy tail. And actually uh, 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 alpha stable Cauchy, so that's an example of a very heavy tail distribution that's also part of the family. Okay, so essentially we have like from non-sparse Gaussian to sparser uh, in, in that family. Now, uh, to show you one, I mean, it's a very stereotyped example. I mean, it doesn't look like Lena, okay? <laughs> but that's, you know, that's the image that goes with the heart transform, <laughs> okay? Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it would be like uh, the compound Poisson in 2D, okay? With, with a separable operator. <clears throat> anyway, uh, what are the high level properties of sparse stochastic processes? So, uh, they are infinite divisible. In fact, it's the broadest class of distribution or processes uh, that uh, are, are closed under linear transformations. Okay, and it's what we do in, in signal processing, we do linear transformations. <coughs> now we can do explicit calculation, so we can determine the, the transform domain statistics of those guys. I mean, we have to do lots of Fourier transforms, but it can be done. It's a unifying framework because it includes all traditional families of stochastic process, ARMA, fractional Brownian motion, <coughs> as well as all their non-Gaussian generalization. And, and those guys live in the continuous domain. <coughs> uh, 
Now, it, they get sparsified if you apply wavelets. Actually, there are even processes like Markov-1 processes that we can show, for example, that the Ha transform is independent component for, for, those, uh, <coughs> for those processes. <coughs> and now, actually, they go very well with wavelets because actually one of my former PhD student, Julien Fajot, who is also from around here, very, a very fine mathematician, actually the, he was able to prove in his thesis that sparse stochastic processes are sparse. Okay, because I was telling, of course they're sparse, yeah. <clears throat> but you know, how to, I, I mean, a la Yves Meyer, okay, by, by showing that they are in some beds of space <clears throat> and looking at n-term approximation properties. Okay, so those guys are, are actually, they really go, you know, if you have the beds of spaces, actually, those are like the counterparts in the stochastic world that go with the best of spaces. <clears throat> okay, so that was my introduction. There was no hybrid so far, so let's make it hybrid. What is a hybrid <laughs> stochastic process? Very simple, it's the sum of I independent sparse processes. Okay, actually, uh, by the way, if the guy was uh, Gaussian, Making that sum is, is very uninteresting because it creates a Gaussian guy. So, so you, 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 you gain nothing. Actually, this thing is really interesting because the guys are sparse. <clears throat> so what does it mean? So every guy, SI, has his own innovation model. So every guy you know, is given by an equation like that. So every guy has his own operator, which is the whitening operator. Every guy uh, has his own noise, W, can be like <coughs> random Dirac or, or Gaussian or whatever. Every guy so has his own noise, so every guy has his own Levy exponent. Okay, now every guy has this characteristic functional, so that's something that's a little scary because in infinite dimensions, Actually, you don't have probability distribution. You only have probability measures. But now, the characteristic function, actually, you have. It's, it's called the characteristic function. It was defined by uh, Kolmogorov. It's a, it's a scary beast because instead of taking, uh, let's say, a vector, a frequency variable here, it takes, actually, it indexes with a test function. Okay, anyway, I don't want to make a course over that, but it is fascinating. We have also some specialists in the room. <clears throat> but uh, suffice it to say, here is this formula. And you now to a Russian mathematician, this formula is actually characterizes all possible white noises. Okay, because this is actually the, the characteristic function, which is in some sense the infinite dimensional Fourier transform of the probability measure of the white noise. And it's given by this form here, and it is indexed by phi here, which is a test function. Okay, so that gives a characterization. You see, what's important is the Levy exponent here. <coughs> now, those processes here, by using this trick here, you can write the SI by L minus 1 W, and then you can move the L minus 1 on this side by taking the adjoint, and then actually you can, you can look at you can actually write it like that. So you can directly, if you know the characteristic function of the white noise, you can d d define, uh, deduce actually the characteristic function of the S. Now, when the guys are independent, that's a fantastic uh, property of characteristic functions, but it also works in infinite dimensional characteristic functionals. Actually, you get <coughs> the product here and be because of the exponential you can transform it in a sum. So actually, this is a complete characterization of those hybrid processes. You would say, okay, maybe not very useful, but at least mathematically, <coughs> we can write it like that. Okay, now let me show you some. Audio, uh, okay, it's maybe not the right conference. We are like imaging, <coughs> but uh, just bear with me. I, I, I'll, sh I, I'll make you listen to a stochastic process a uh, stochastic process called A minor. <coughs> so first, the, <coughs> the Gaussian. Hmm? <coughs> oh, yeah. I know. I, I, I took off the sound. Oh. 
oh shit, I, I, I don't know how to put it back. <coughs> uh, or maybe, the, I, I, I think, is there a sound for, <laughs> maybe, okay, so I, 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 I will, I will simulate it to you. So, <laughs> so the, the Gaussian, may, may, essentially, it makes, <laughs> but sort with a, with, with a, you know, like <clears throat> a minor in envelope of, of uh, the spectrum. Now, the, 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 the other one, the <clears throat> this one, uh, the generalized Levy, this one sounds like chimes. Ding dong, ding dong, 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 ding. Okay, it has exactly the same power spectrum. But, but now, if I try to go on MP3, and I, oops, where, where am I? Yeah, if I try to com compress the Gaussian, MP3 fails. It cannot compress. If I do the chimes, it, it works perfectly because it's sparse. Okay, so, so essentially, so you have Gaussian sparse. Okay, so it's too bad because the sound is, is really nice. But anyway, okay, let's get back to the, the topic of, of, the course, uh, of the talk, which is the solution of linear inverse problems. Okay. So now, how do we discretize? Actually, we, you see in the computer, we cannot work with the continuum, so we have to put basis functions. So we start by, uh, you know, choosing some basis function. Of course, I'm biased, I'm always put splines, but I mean, you can put wavelets, whatever you want. So you choose some basis functions. <coughs> and, uh, but here's more like a sort of spline-like basis function. And we also know that the signal is actually a sum <coughs> of those uh, sparse stochastic process independent. Now, every guy here has his own expansion with some coefficient si and has his own innovation. It's actually a discrete innovation because we had this thing like w equal ls. So now when we discretize, we have something similar. We have u instead of w is equal to ls, and now s is the discrete representation of the process, so just the projection of the basis function. L is the discretization of the whitening operator. Let's say if it's a derivative, this guy is a finite difference. And uh, so, so this guy, okay, so that's the innovation. <coughs> uh, now uh, we also have the physics. Now, now the physics here, they involve integrals. Uh, so, so in every sensor actually has an equivalent impulse response. So if you do tomography, this could be line integrals. And, and, and then you have the noise here. But this, once you discretize with those basis functions, you can rewrite the way I, I had it in the first slide, <coughs> that actually you have a system matrix Y equal H. Now not times S. Now it's S1 plus S2 plus SI plus the noise, okay? So now we want uh, to, to construct our algorithm. So now we are, we're using Bayes' rule, like uh, we, we saw in the previous talk. So we want actually to get the probability of given the measure uh, of the S1 to SI given the measurement. So applying Bayes' rule, we can write it like that. <coughs> so so this, this probability of the measurement, if you knew the noise, is actually the probability uh, now, if you knew the signal is actually the probability of, of the noise, and, and, and so this guy, okay, we can absorb in, in this z, then essentially what you have, the probability of the noise multiplied by the probability of the signal. But now, <coughs> uh, first of all, now we have this hi hypothesis of independence, okay? So S1 to SI independence, so I can make the product of, of, of those individual signals. Now I have the innovation model also that every S can be whitened or made independent. And so this, uh, uh, actually here, since I, I just have a linear relation, it means that just the probability of S is proportional to the probability of the innovation. <coughs> but if you say, okay, this L operator can whiten, actually this can be made into a product. And so at the end you can just write it like that and Okay, statement of map reconstruction problems. So now at the end we were with this model, HS plus N, S equal the sum of those guys, L 
ESI equal UI, those are IID with you know, some certain known potential function that corresponds uh, to, to those infinite divisible laws. So the, uh, the, uh, the uh, posterior distribution is given by that. <coughs> I take the log, and what do I get is this. Okay, so it looks almost like on my first slide, not quite. What is different, on the first slide I have just one S, okay, so here I have S1 plus SI, and uh, I, I just had one term here was, was the LP, and here I just have a sum of <coughs> I terms uh, with those guys here that are like the, the potential function corresponding to the different components. Okay, hybrid model reformulation. So I can write it like that. Okay, now here's the trick. And you know, as, as often in math, you're a little lazy. So you try to write it back like something you know. <coughs> so augmented formulation of the problem. So now, uh, okay, I have this S1 plus SI, they mix together to give the signal. But now let's define now uh, augmented unmixed signal, okay? So that would just be the concatenation of S1 to SI. I can write the augmented innovation vector, okay, it's just uh, I times more. I can write the augmented system matrix. It's just very easy, it's like <coughs> just concatenation of the same system matrix I times. I can <coughs> write the augmented whi whitening operator. It's just the concatenation of the whitening operators with zeros elsewhere. <coughs> and if I write it like that, <coughs> now it looks more like what was on my first slide. Okay, so that uh, I have like a system matrix, uh, you know, some potential function, and I can define this auxiliary variable u equal L augmented. Okay, so actually what I have then to, to solve is this thing here. Okay, so augmented matrix S, now those phi's. Now maybe to make the link with what you already know, actually, what do those phi's look like? For example, if the guys are assumed to be Gaussian, the phi's are actually X2. Okay, so that would be L2, penalty. <coughs> if the guy here uh, is Laplace, which is part of the infinite divisible, uh, actually this guy is L2, uh, as L1 norm. Now if you have something heavy tail like student distribution, uh, this guy is more like a log, and actually you can show that this log is, behaves a little like uh, L0. Okay, so but that's another story. So, okay, you have those potential functions. Now, uh, so that's the new problem, <coughs> but actually it's the same as the standard problem. Because if I had been here like three years ago, I would have given the talk, the same talk, but without the hybrid parts. And I would have exactly the same equation here, except this is not augmented. Okay, so, and I have the potential function. Why am I saying that? I can reuse the same algorithm, okay? It's just uh, have to apply it in something larger. So how does the algorithm work? It's always the same trick. You use proximal operators. And, and so this is the guy that will just pointwise actually solve that problem. So that was the potential function. So usually you could have a L2 term or, a, or a absolute value. Okay, here we are a little more daring because phi is not necessarily convex, but I, I, I mean, this can still, ha still has a minimum. <coughs> and, and so actually what you can say in any case, this problem here has a solution that looks like a mapping from the input space, which is y, the measurement, to the output space here, which is u, which is, you know, the guy that you are trying to solve for, which in that case is like the innovation. Okay, so the, whatever the, you know, the potential function, you can d design here a, a thing. So anyway, so if it's uh, uh, the L2, you get linear attenuation, so that's uh, L2 minimization. Uh, this guy is a soft threshold of compressed sensing, and, and if you have more like a heavy tail, it's more something that looks like LP with P uh, uh, smaller than, than one. Anyway, so this g g gets us to now our algorithm, 
And actually what we're using is, is just the augmented Lagrangian. So we use this auxiliary variable innovation as <coughs> auxiliary variable. And then we just uh, use augmented Lagrangian. So we put this penalty here with Lagrange multiplier. I mean, this is like standard stuff that you do in convex optimization. <coughs> so we can just rewrite it like that. Now the new thing here is just this guy's augmented, this guy's augmented, this guy's augmented, but otherwise it's business as, as usual. And actually what you get at the end is this algorithm which is, uh, uses the ADMM, so alternating direction method of multipliers, and so you can do uh, a sequential minimization. You can first assume the U and alpha are, are known, and so for S, then update your Lagrange multipliers, and then as assume the signal is known and so for you. Now the good news is this step here is linear. So you can even borrow the algorithm of the 20th century, you know, like linear <coughs> inverse uh, methods. And so, so you, 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 you have, <coughs> here's just a linear step. And then you have a, a, your a pointwise nonlinear denoising where you can here ap apply those proximal operators that of course depend on, on uh, your Levy exponent and on, on, on your, your thing here. Okay. I, I mean, here I have to apologize because, uh, uh, oops, uh, no, I, I think I'm okay time-wise. I have to apologize because I don't really have uh, images to show you for the hybrid model. Actually, I asked my student like three days ago, can you do some? So he's been working really hard at night. He, he has some results, but they're not really okay. Uh, <coughs> but, but anyways, what, what I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you some images but that are obtained from a non-hybrid model. And then I show you like 1D examples of a hybrid model. And hopefully in one week, my student will have solved the, the numerical problems. And, <coughs> and so we'll, we'll have the images. Okay, so, so we, we, we look at deconvolution, so that's just a reminder of the physics. I mean, I mean here, like some kind of, uh, you know, typical images in, in biology. Uh, I mean, actually, what I, I chose here, because like, uh, you know, compressed sensing, people always tell you, yeah, L1 is better. Uh, and uh, actually here, I was trying like more to show, like find pictures like where uh, for example, this picture here, which are like the stem cells, this is a picture for which actually L2 is the best, okay? And, and, and so, so it's, it's, it's actually doing a little like uh, what Cecile was doing, like using the gradient as, as, as a, you know, <coughs> decoupling operator and then e either imposing your L1, which is this guy here, so which would be total variation, but uh, I mean, uh, à, à la Osher, <coughs> and uh, anyway, so it's just running this algorithm. So it's just to tell you it works. Uh, it also works in real life. So, so this is like a 3D deconvolution of uh, uh, fluorescence micrographs. So, so uh, um, it also works in tomography. Uh, and actually in tomography, uh, actually the L2, for example, now, in tomography, it's, it's, it's funny because the people use the Shep Logan uh, phantom, okay? So this guy is more like L0. And of course, L0 works the better, best, but for example, for this image here, it's actually L2 works better for, than L1. But anyway, uh, okay. We also did it with real data. So actually now we're kind of proud in, in Lausanne because we have a Nobel Prize like Dubosche. In fact, I, I worked with Dubosche. I have a few papers with Dubosche, but... Uh, uh, some years ago, but anyway, so it also works on, on you, know, you know, cryo electron microscopy, but this is, uh, you know, the, the non-hybrid version, hybrid version, okay? So now, what about hybrid? Okay, because my talk is about hybrid, so, okay, I, I get back to hybrid. So in principle, you know, the non-hybrid is a special case of hybrid, so it's still, a, you know, you can refer to the previous images can only work better, it cannot work worse, okay? <laughs> so, uh, okay, so here a hybrid, S1 plus S2. And actually, what are we using here? So L1 is a derivative, L2 the second derivative, and we're using here impulsive noise, so it so goes with D1. So impulsive noise actually will generate something piecewise constant, 
which is shown here. So that would be like steps. And then actually the other guy here, the, uh, uh, the, the, the blue one, is a Gaussian guy, is very smooth. Okay, so <coughs> if you add the two, you get the red guy here, which is a, a, a piecewise smooth, okay, which jumps. <coughs> so now the, the question is, can we recover? And it, it's, it's not so easy a priori because maybe, I don't know if you noticed, but you know, I, I have uh, two times more unknown. I have only so many measurements. Now with my hybrid model, I have, I have two times more. So I can guarantee you if it was Gaussian, it would be the end of the, the story. It's impossible, okay? But the sparsity makes it possible. Actually, you can recover. <coughs> and so here's an experiment. So Fourier sampling. So in this case, we take a quasi-random Fourier sampling in, 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 in uh, uh, you know, uh, so sinusoids to, to measure, uh, it's, it's like simulating MRI. A little more at low frequency, like in MRI, you always take more at low frequency. And now here we are, uh, we are comparing the three methods here. Hybrid, okay, so it's essentially you have a L1 term on the S1, a L2 term on the S2. We have TV, just the L1 term, and we have Wiener, just uh, the, the L2 term. And <coughs> so here are the reconstruction for the three methods. Okay, so, so now, what is like, uh, the black here is Wiener. Okay, what's important is the original is the red. So the, the, the Wiener is not so close. Actually, then we tuned everything for optimal, okay? So uh, the Wiener was tuned so that it gets as good as it can. The uh, total variation was tuned. Everyone was tuned so that they get as good as they can. Now, the hybrid is pretty close to the red. And the total variation, okay, is not so good either, okay? So that uh, really shows actually you are able actually to unmix the signals. And <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, so here, uh, here are the unmixed, uh, so the original uh, S1 and S2 and the reconstructed S1 and S2, and uh, they, 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 they've been unmixed. Okay, so, so that's actually quite remarkable. Sometimes we are off by uh, an offset because actually the two operators have the same null space, but uh, so you have to, <coughs> to impose some boundary conditions. Okay, comparison, so we looked at the number of measurements here signal-to-noise ratio, and so the hybrid method always works better. So we always beat either TV or Wiener. <coughs> uh, it's not too surprisingly because actually it conforms with the model. So here's another example of, of hybrid. Okay, so here the, the, the original is the red signal, and, and the hybrid is the green, and you see how closely you follow as, as Wiener versus total variation is not able to do as good a job. <coughs> and, and so now the unmixed components, and so here is actually a, an example where we don't get the offset right, but that we don't care. The shape is still okay. So that's the piecewise constant. So that's the original, that's the reconstructed. So uh, the, just the algorithm decided for some reason to put more or less constant in the Gaussian or, or the total variation channel. <coughs> okay, so, conclusion. Uh, so, I think uh, the main point of this talk, and, and that's really a little my philosophy, is, uh, you know, the models I've been presenting are in the continuous domain. Okay, so, so that's, uh, and, 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 and also what's interesting here, that you are backwards compatible with the Gaussian theory. And you have this operator-based formulation. So you have like stochastic differential equations that are now not driven by Gaussian stuff like it's usually the case, but by Levy. And it's actually this Levy uh, part that gives the sparse behavior. And, 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 and so we, we really have this dichotomy between Gaussian on one side and, and, and sparse in the other. I think what was nice with the hybrid example 
actually we, we can put the two in, 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 in a common hybrid model and actually the algorithm is kind of able to separate between the Gaussian and, and the sparse part. Now, the regularization, now you understand exactly what's happening, is actually this whitening operator that's in the background that will uncouple the, the information. And uh, it also explains why wavelets work, because actually wavelets, they act like derivatives. Okay, so that's the reason why wavelets will uh, uncouple those those kind of processes, but here we can really use the operators, we don't need the wavelets. But uh, if you do with wavelets, it works similarly. And then actually what we have is also like the potential function. The potential function, they depend on the Levy exponent. And they may or may not be convex. Actually, all the sparse guys are non-convex. It's like the TV is just the guy at the front here and all the others which are more heavy-tailed are non-convex, but you can still run algorithms and they converge to something. Maybe it's not the global, but at least the local optimum. I think it's an interesting conceptual framework for sparse uh, signal recovery because it's a, it's a principled approach that will tell you of algorithms. Okay, it's like, uh, for example, the, uh, the ones that uh, the maximum a posteriori. And uh, the generalization uh, is this hybrid model. And I actually, if for those who know compressed sensing, there's a big similarity with what's called sparse encoding or dictionaries. Okay, it's like every L defines a dictionary. Okay, we have Li, but it's like a differential operator that uh, defines a dictionary. And the unmixing is possible because you are sparse. If you were not sparse, this thing would not work. And also, it, uh, doing hybrid Gaussian model is, is pointless, okay? Because actually, Gaussian, you know everything anyway. It's the Wiener filter that's the best end of the story. <coughs> okay, so there, I, I must say there are some challenges. Okay, so first challenge, my uh, student, uh, Thomas, hopefully uh, is able to uh, actually, just for the fun, I can show you the, the picture he, sh he sent me yesterday at 11 o'clock uh, to show you that we're getting there, but we're not going there. But no, no, but he has lots of merit because he just started a few days ago to work on that problem. Uh, I mean, now the, the challenge is, is model identification, okay, because uh, you know, why should we use the gradient? Why should we use the Laplacian, etc.? Why should we use uh, L1? Actually, uh, uh, you know, that has some connection with learning so that uh, these uh, models need to be fit to the data. I have to thank many, many people, so especially Thomas here, uh, for f uh, and, and, and Pakshal who made those, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, 1D examples. I have to thank those guys as well. Um, Okay, so here, here are some references, but maybe just uh, for the fun, let me show you the image I got at, you know, 11 o'clock yesterday. Okay, so, so but I, I mean, that was an image, so blurred, and we're trying to unmix. So this is, you know, I, I think the tuning is not correct, but, you, you know, something is coming out. Okay, so that's the total variation image that is kind of piecewise constant, and so that's the Ga Gaussian, but I, I think it's, a, it's, it's not well-tuned here. But, but somehow it's, it's, it's capable of uh, mixing to, to some extent. And, and now what's interesting, so this is like a bounded variation, and this is like Zobolev, okay? So it's like a U plus V model of like, you know, a piecewise constant plus uh, a regular parts, and I, I so I, I, I think in, in, you know, in a few weeks we'll, 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 we'll have like those algorithms working on, on real images as well. Anyway, thank you very much. Questions? Marcelo? Hi, thank you very much. I, I really like this um, theoretical framework that, that you have developed. I was wondering if you had had the opportunity to study some properties of the estimators. So, for instance, I don't think we know anything about map estimation in that setting. 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, this, this is a very uh, important and sore point in some sense because uh, map estimation, actually, we found it works pretty well for Gaussian. And uh, empirically, we found it also to work relatively well for uh, alpha stable. But in between, it's, it's a little not so good. For, for example, just to show that it can be ridiculous, for example, if I really take the compound Poisson. The compound Poisson, we all know that L1 is the best, but the map estimator actually <laughs> tells you zero. <laughs> hmm. You know, because it's, it's actually not such a good estimator. But on the more pragmatic side, I, I would say that this framework actually gives you a, a family of, of algorithms. And for example, the, the one for the, let's say, that goes with the, with, with the uh, exponential that goes with L1. It's actually not good for the, 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 the levy of the L1. It's good for the compound Poisson. So it's, it seems that there's a mix up of estimators. But let's say uh, the, the, the thing is, 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 is large enough to span lots and lots of estimators. And so the pragmatic solution to that is actually learning. You, you, you know, it's if you can fit the parameters of the model or optimize the parameters of the model based on, on your data. And, and, and so, for example, we have uh, empirical evidence that, for example, the L1 for, for the, you know, the sort of compound Poisson is super close to the optimal. Okay? But it doesn't really, it's, it corresponds to the map of another guy. Um, just a quick question, and then I'll. So, is the is there um, so if the prior is a stochastic process that is sparse, what can you say about the posterior? Would you um, like your, your random variable conditioning on y? Uh, of of the posterior? Yeah. <coughs> Could you analyze, for instance, the sparsity of that? Yeah. So 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 so, uh, in some sense, we, we, we can do the computations. So we are always part of this uh, family of infinite divisible laws, provided you know what we were doing was linear. Like if we are solving linear inverse problem, which is the case for MRI, CT, etc. So we are inside the family of infinite divisible. But there's something a little funny that happens. I mean, the Levy exponent actually, <coughs> the Levy exponent somehow depends on, on, on the transformation. And actually, oops, where, where was it? It was on this slide here. <clears throat> you, you know, like, uh, you know, it depends on, on, on what, what you are doing here. Uh, you know, if you are like expressing that in a certain basis, that, that will modify the Levy exponent. So everything can be computed analytically, but. Uh, I mean, we are inside the family. That's all we can say. Thank you. Thank you. Quick question. Uh, why do you insist, insist on starting from uh, the continuous case? Is it uh, <coughs> for the beauty of it, or does it have uh, uh, practical benefits? Well, uh, I, I mean, you, you know, from my point of view, the objects you want to recover <coughs> live in the continuum. So, uh, so, so I would say just from the philosophical point of view, uh, I, I prefer, but you know I'm biased, okay? I prefer always to look at the problem from the continuous domain. So that, that's, we, we would say, a ph philosophical answer. Now, the mathematical answer is actually you cannot do any computation in the discrete domain. It's much, much harder. So, 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 so here, you, you know, those tools like the characteristic functional of the Russians, you know, th this, this kind of stuff here that I can do. You see, uh, you, you know, there's this integral with the phi you don't have in the discrete domain. So, so it's much, much harder. You can with alpha stable. It's the only case I know that you can maybe do the computation in the discrete domain. But here you can really do those closed forms that I, I don't know how to do in the discrete domain. Okay. No, we have to keep on schedule, so maybe a quick question. Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry. Um, I was wondering if uh, in your last slide, the S1 was related to your impulse noise and the S2 to your Gaussian noise? <coughs> yes. As, okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so let's thank uh, Michael again. Thank you.